Hello, everyone, and happy Saturday. We have a very exciting webinar today, uh, Astrology and the Soul's Purpose with Michael Bartlett. Uh, this is going to be a very exciting lecture, so please do, I guess you're here already, so <laughs> you already know. All right, let's go over some logistics. Now, if you can't hear anything, then you can't hear me talking right now. But either way, you this, if you can't hear me, you can read this. <laughs> um, and these are things you can do if your audio goes out like the middle of the session. Sometimes that happens. And if it does, just check your audio settings and make sure that you're using the right speaker. Sometimes those can be, um, you know, the wrong the wrong speaker is in your little settings. And to do that, you just you just go in where it says audio and it'll say, okay, which microphone, which speaker with a little like uh, speaker signal. So make sure that your volume is also turned up. Sometimes we forget like, okay, I muted something the other day and then I forgot to turn my volume back on. So simple things like that. And then if it all fails, you can log out and come back in. Sometimes that helps as well. Okay, and another thing, if you have any questions, I am your gal. You just type these questions away in the little chat box, and then I can ask them for you. Uh, Michael, would you prefer question, me asking questions during or after? I'm fine with it either way. As it comes up for people, I'm happy to go over it, and, and also there will be time at the end as well for question and answer. So this is really, I, I've, I've spaced it enough so there's enough time, talking time, but also for interaction with people, which I always enjoy. Great. Folks will be really happy with that, I believe. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the, the next really important aspect of this webinar is is scholar is the scholarship fund now if you don't know michael is donating his time today and thank you michael so much uh, for for bringing this to the community um, in a way that is, is helping build our um our education and and another thing is if you haven't donated to kepler please know that every donation is is helping to raise much needed scholarship monies. So I wanna thank anyone who has already donated. And if you haven't donated, please click on the donate button on the website. Also, if you make any purchases through Amazon, please consider choosing Kepler College of Astrological Arts and Sciences as your Amazon Smile charity of choice by just going to smile.amazon.com. Through this, any purchase you make, will a percentage will go to Kepler, and that's really helpful. And also, just as another reminder, Kepler is a 501c3 charity, and all donations from the U.S. are tax deductible. So, so that's really important to know when you're doing taxes, that, that if you donate to us, you will be getting some something back, and, and that's important. Um, every donation counts, even one or two dollars, um, and, and just think about like if every single person who attends or registers donates one dollar, that, that will really help someone out to get the education that they, they really desire. Um, and, and here's here's a little spiel about our scholarship fund. If, if you are a student who is in need, please feel free to reach out and contact Donna. Um, we're, we're regularly giving away, like we're really wanting the community to grow and, and we're giving away scholarships to, to help your education. And, and personally, I receive, receive scholarship funds and it's really helped me continue on the diploma track as a student. So moving forward, here are some, some more workshops coming up with Michael and I'd love if if um, Michael if you could just say a few words about about the upcoming workshops it's really exciting stuff so sure yeah so in the past we've offered this as, as a multi like a five-week course and what we found is it that, that um, that it'd be a little more exciting and more interactive to break them down into workshop classes so what we've done is I've taken each of kind of like the significant parts of the building blocks of esoteric astrology and made them into four separate workshops so on october 31st on halloween before you get your costume on and the house all decorated well the house will probably already be decorated right um i'll be talking on the rays um 
and a lot of this will make more sense after I do the talk today, but um, I'm going to be touching on a little bit on each of these today. Um, the rays are seven of them and talks about basically the building blocks of, astro of esoteric astrology. And then the um, second class is going to be on November 21st, just before Thanksgiving, and I'll be talking about the esoteric planets, meaning how the planets are looked at from an esoteric rulership and um, and uh, the ways they express themselves on a different higher level in that regard. The third presentation or the third workshop will be on uh, December 5th, yeah, thank you, <laughs> uh, of this year. Um, that's also going to be a Saturday uh, on uh, on the signs. We're going to be going over each of the 12 signs and talking about them as well as their esoteric rulers. There's a whole different set of rulers for um, for the signs from an esoteric perspective. And finally, on the fourth and final class for this group is gonna be on January 16th, and it's gonna be on the uh, breaking down the astrological houses. Um, after that, uh, we'll probably do some workshops that will be about integrating all of the synthesizing them, um, because then hopefully we'll have enough people who are interested in, in, in kind of taking this a little deeper and seeing, um, you know, kind of how this plays out in the, not only the intricate complexity of it all, but just like the beautiful, uh, the beautiful uh, balance of it all as well, the harmonics. So thank you, Kaylin. Yeah, um, and I just want to also point out that the 31st, there is a full moon in Taurus, so that's that's a lovely day to to really start your dive into this topic. Um, and if you're here, I know you're already interested. I'm personally very interested and excited for today, and and will likely register for through these workshops. So, um, yeah, I, I, we're all looking forward to them. And it's exciting to know that like the the most important pieces are going to be covered in each workshop. So. That's that's something I think that's very unique and important. So thank you, Michael. And moving forward, here's just an overview of some of the upcoming webinars and workshops going on in Kepler. Um, we have the Bridge course, which is coming up, and and that's a course that if you've you know if you've been practicing astrology and you already kind of know the, the fundamentals then you can take a test to see if you qualify to kind of skip 101 and go into the bridge course. Um, so it's important to, if, if that's something that's that's interesting to you, check it out and and, and challenge yourself with the, with the test and, and see if you can pass and go into the bridge course. Uh, the next one we have coming up is, is all about like how we can use transits to reach our potential. Um, and then the one after that, the return of the stars, and that's really going into how the stars are connected to our, our charts. Um, and then Neptune and our charts, the seven stages of development. This is a five-week workshop, and it's going to help you dig into Neptune and how this transpersonal planet can really help you uh, develop. And then we have with our Robert Glasscock, Horary Power, Life in the Moment. And this is a nine week workshop that really digs into horary um, astrology. So if you're interested in, in working with events and, and predictions in that way, that's a great one to take. Uh, and then the last one is Reaching for the Stars. And that's, um, that's to really fulfill your potential again with, with the astrological. Um, chart. Now, these are all so. So, as you're seeing this theme of how can we build and grow with astrology, uh, that that's really an important thing. So, you can look at the different avenues and the ways you can explore that, and it's all going towards that development of the self and and tracking the internal and external parts of that. And here are some fall classes that are still available for registration. Uh, we have a lot of exciting things. You can definitely you can read this information on your own, and and I'm going to talk a little bit about it. So, so all classes are you can you can take them as um, standalone classes, or you can take them if you're pursuing a diploma or a certificate. Know that you're not confined to one avenue or path. If you have like say an interest in family patterns then you might be interested in the the family patterns and the astrology and adolescence 
for parents and teachers. If you're interested in Vedic astrology, we have that and that integration of, of how can the Western astrologer approach Vedic astrology. Uh, we, we have a lot of options here, so you can kind of just pick and choose as you go along. And if you're on the diploma track, though, know that there's going to need need to be some foundational classes, but you can still, as you see what we offer, what what really captures your attention and, and enlivens your soul and, and gravitate towards that. Now, here are some self-paced classes. These are things you can take as you go if you have a busy life, busy schedule, but you're like, man, I really want to learn how astronomy and astrology work together. You can do that on a self way and you can really you know motivate yourself and and work through it as as easy as quick or as um, methodically as you need to know that if you are pursuing the diploma track though you you will need to take history and astronomy um, those are both required all the others are considered electives and again you don't need to take the diploma track in order to to register for one of these classes. And now getting into today's webinar. So the big questions here, have you ever asked the question, is there more to life? What about what is my soul's purpose? I don't know personally anyone who hasn't asked these questions. So it's, it's amazing that there is a, a focus of astrology specifically on the soul's purpose and going into the esoteric wisdom of the seven rays and how that really um, you can use that information to build and grow on a soul level that's that's pretty amazing um, so if you've asked these questions and you've pondered it uh, while lying and looking up at the stars and asking why what's the purpose this is the right webinar for you and the upcoming workshops make a lot of sense to help you compile that wisdom and knowledge. And now introducing Michael. So as you know, I mean, if you're registered for this, you know he's a rock star and you know that his focus is on traditional and es esoteric astrology. Some, some key things from this little bio here, He's worked extensively with Alan Oaken. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And, and also he produces ongoing webinars, workshops, extensive intensive reading, speaking engagements, and teaches classes for Kepler. I mean, he's, it, it seems like, as you can see, that he's this teacher that's very passionate about the topic. And, and that's who you want. You want someone passionate who will dive deeply with you in order to help you evolve and grow as an individual. Um, here, just to check out his website and all of his offerings, not just the ones at Kepler, here's coremichael.com, and, and here is his contact information as well um, to, to learn more. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic to Michael now. Let's see. Okay. All righty, show my screen and camera make this a little yeah. smaller block everything well there okay. you are. Yeah, and thank you so much for that introduction um of course yeah i think all of us here i mean it's a saturday afternoon for some of us um all of us who are here must be very passionate about astrology and seeking and learning about our um our soul selves so um thank you so much kaylin thank you to Kepler College and the wonderful opportunities they provide and i'm really happy to be here and teaching and Happy to hear to answer questions and go over this. So I'm going to give a brief overview of esoteric astrology and then kind of break down a couple of little interesting pieces. Even though this is a free course, I always want people to go away with something of value. Um, I, when I do personal readings, when I do more one-on-one -on -one work, I really feel that's a, a valuable thing to um, that I need to charge for clearly because of the time and the effort that is involved. But when I do this sort of work, when I'm teaching to a larger group, it's really, um, I think it's important um, in this art form, in this science that we're working with, uh, in this tool that gives great comfort to all of us, as well as the people we're working with, to help lay seeds, to plant seeds for us all to be doing um, our highest work possible and, and, and 
creating an environment for astrology to continue to foster, which Kepler College is, is so phenomenal about. So I'm greatly honored to be here and I'm greatly honored for all of you to be here today. So I will start. Da, 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 da. <laughs> so um, one of the, we're gonna start with what's called the great invocation. Um, from the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May the one return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let the purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. And from the center which we call the race of men, for humankind, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Now, for those of you who have ever kind of stepped into esoterics um, <clears throat> and looked at, you know, um, the um, Lucius Trust works and Ann Bailey's, Alice Bailey's work, um, it's very much rooted in an older way of looking at things. And so I, while I, while there is that root to it, while there is kind of this God dogma, while there's this kind of Christianity dogma and orientation towards man, I just want to let you know that I don't perceive it that way. I see it as more of like life force, universal force. I also see um, it as, you know, man, or when I use words like men or whatever, I just automatically translate to woman and man, to humankind. So these are the things that I really encourage each of you when you encounter, especially older texts, because they were written with such a bias and we're coming into such a time now where we're really starting to break that down and understand and see things differently. I think it's really good for us to point these things out and, and even as we're reading them to, to add that extra pronoun out there or to change it so it, it's more inclusive and so you allow whoever you are in relationship to be a part of what's welcome at the table. And it's really crucial. So as Kaylin said, you know, have you ever asked yourself, what is my life's, what is my soul's purpose? Why am I here? Is there something more to life? What is my true path in life? Not just that nine to five kind of thing, but what's that true? What is it my true calling? Why do I keep having these experiences? Why do these people keep showing up in my life? Why do I keep having being awakened in the middle of the night, or why do I hear certain things at certain times? Maybe why do I feel depressed all the time? I believe that through the use of astrology in general and esoteric astrology in particular, you can learn how to break out of the box you've created for yourself and align yourself with why you are here. Um, life is all about programming, whether it comes from our parents, whether it comes from our um, our schools, our communities, we're constantly being programmed by everyone around us. And what is really important about esoteric astrology is this connection with spirit, um, which we're gonna delve in um, over the course of this. And before there was evolutionary astrology, there was esoteric astrology. And so what do we call a soul? What is spirituality and why esoteric astrology? First of all, I think it's really important to understand that um, esoteric astrology is really not for everyone. While everyone is ensouled, everyone is a conscious being on whatever level that is occurring, not everyone is here to be living a soul-focused life. Um, it doesn't mean that people aren't operating on in a way that fits in with a larger plan, but it's, it's, there are different levels about how this operates. And it's not... Um, I think it's really important, at least the way I look at it, I don't see this as a hierarchy. I mean, there is a hierarchy, but it's it's not a hierarchy of better than. It's more of a hierarchy of um, maturity in a sense. I mean, one of, my, one of my favorite sayings is you can never expect a four-year-old to drive a car. And so there are certain things that as one steps onto the path of spirituality, um, whether one has done that this lifetime alone or whether one has done this for many lifetimes is going to kind of show a little bit of a difference in where one steps into it. I also personally believe that one can also just spontaneously step into it if everything's all set up properly. The soul is, of course, that which we cannot see. It's the part of us that was here before we were born and will continue to be after our physical bodies no longer exist. 
And I see spirituality as the quality of being concerned with the human spirit or soul as opposed to material or physical things. It's the seeking of that which lies all around within and without. There's nothing really separate from consciousness. An esoteric astrology seeks to give one, all of us, the tools to blend personality or exoteric self, um, traditional sense of self, with the solar esoteric self so as to do more soul-centered work in one's life. It begins to be a different focus. It begins to be a different orientation about how you see things, how you operate, um, stepping out of the blame game, stepping out of um, the projection game, stepping out of uh, the victim role. It doesn't mean we don't fall into those things from time to time because that might be you know, what we're here to learn, but, um, it, but it's understanding that we can step out of it. Um, for those of you um, who've ever heard of uh, A Life in Five Chapters is a great one. It's, I walk down the street, I see a hole, I fall into it. Um, it takes me a while, but I get out. Uh, the second chapter, I walk down the street, I fall in the hole again. Third chapter, I walk down the street, I fall in again. The, the fifth chapter is I walk down a different street. It's that thing of, you know, we like to say in, in our society or the way we look at things here in the West is we see things as failures. But the truth is humans don't typically learn easily and don't learn quickly. Um, as they say, um, a, a thorn of experience is worth a wilderness of warning. So there's something inherent about actually having a certain experience and not and and knowing that that's what it is and building out of it. Um, if we continue to do that our whole lifetime, then I think yeah, then then um, I, I don't like to use the word failure for people. I I, I don't I yeah. So um, but it's more of a sense of you know hopefully at, at a certain point and and it, for every person it it's very individualized. Um, we all awaken, we all come to whatever awareness is that we need to when we need to do it. At a certain point in our lives, we become sick and tired of operating at a level that is clearly not working for us and we choose to do something different. Um, that's probably why many of us, I know that's why I got into astrology originally. And what I like about the esoteric aspects is it takes that again and, and further um, explains it in, in ways to, to put into higher practice. Uh, this focus requires a level of intellectual sophistication and discernment. Um, what I like to tell people is it's very, very helpful if you have at least a, a basic understanding of astrology, because it's it's almost like, I don't know if you remember back in the day, um, those of you who are old enough, um, you know, the, what they call transparency. So it's like you have a sheet of paper and it has writing on it, and then the transparency has, transparency has something else on it, and you lay it over it, and it kind of adds another dimension to it. That's kind of like how I see it with the esoteric understanding. It adds another level, it adds another um, a further definition, a further dis discernment or, or sophistication. And the intellectual part's really important, I think, um, because it's about connecting and the, and the goal is eventually about synthesis. It's about understanding about how any one thread of anything then fits into the greater collective whole. Kind of like when you look at an, like a, an oriental carpet or, um, or clothing, you know, anything that's woven, that's kind of like the idea is being able to understand what that means and why it is and, and, and why it's there. Um, and like I said a little bit ago, the Bailey teachings are very Christ-based, um, so um, please feel free to adjust it as you need. Um, it is about love, love, wisdom, which is the second ray. And but I feel it's important for you to call it whatever you feel. I, I don't think it's. I think names um, names are really powerful. Um, you know, they're, it's ancient magic for one. The naming of things, the ca is a casting of a spell when you name something. So. You know, if if you have you come from a Jewish background, you come from a Buddhist background, you come from um, an Islamic background, um, please place whatever it is. You come from a spiritual background, please place whatever words you want. It's um, over time. If you're not already aware of what that energy is, you will begin to become aware of it. Um, for Alan, who was raised um, Jewish, he um, has a very close kinship with Christ. He really perceives that and doesn't have any trouble with switching that over. I don't feel that it needs those sorts of boxes. So I think it's really important for people to be, to experience their freedom um, because this is really the key thing. I, I believe that with religion, it's about following other people's beliefs or other people's doctrine, where spirituality is following one's inner guidance. 
Um, of course, inner guidance can be a very tricky slope, right? I mean, if you're hearing voices in your head, are the, voice, are the voices in your head voices of a part of yourself that are not incorporated? Or maybe there are voices of uh, people who have passed on. I mean, there are different levels of how you hear things. And part of the importance is to be able to differentiate, discriminate, understand, and perceive at what level those are operating. I'll take a sip of water, excuse me. Il n'y a pas de religion supérieure à la vérité. So there is no religion higher than truth is, is the understanding of the theosophical study, which study, which society. <laughs> Sorry, I have a uh, Mercury Uranus trine and sometimes I get too fast for my mouth. Um, so I'll slow down a bit. Um, uh, theosophical start, society started in 1875 and the Tibetan, who's also known as Joao Kuhl or the master, first appeared to Blavatsky, Madame Blavatsky, in her book, The Secret Doctrine in 1888. And then she appeared, um, then he appeared, of course, in several of Alice Bailey's telepathically received books. There's a clear um, clarification, you see that I put telepathically, many, but we, a lot of us call this now is channeling, but it's, it's, um, said to have been done from a different frequency of energy, just to, to clarify that. So esoteric astrology is really just one aspect of Alice Bailey's ageless wisdom teachings, which she stated the Tibetan master Dwal Kul shared with her. Esoteric astrologers typically base their studies on Alice's five volume treaty on the seven rays, which uh, specific specifically focus on volume three, which is esoteric astrology. These works focus on ensouled matter, the path of the initiated disciple, the evolution of soul consciousness, and the issues which block that evolution. Bailey presented a more fully developed and articulated astrology than previously presented by Blavatsky. Blavatsky's amount of energy on, um, amount of information on, on astrology is actually fairly, um, almost singular line for each. Whereas anyone who, I'd really highly recommend anyone to pick up the um, specifically esoteric astrology by Alice Bailey. Um, it, it gave me goosebumps as I read it because it, it just kind of filled in places of, of understanding. Um, there's a little bit of a Vedic sense about it. Um, if you look at Alan Liu, who we're talking about in a second, his, he spent a lot of time in India and so he, really brought forth a lot more of a, um, a Vedic understanding and wove that back into Western astrology and brought forth a more of a psychologically oriented astrology. Let's see. And here we are, it's a pseudonym he used. He's widely given credit for starting the movement towards a more psychologically oriented analysis in astrology. And he was one of the first advocates to argue for a loose interpretation of possible trends of experience. Um, what Rick Tarnas calls valence, rather than predictive astrology, meaning that there, you know, there are archetypal themes that are likely to appear when certain planets are in relationship to one another. His influence has been described as making a turning point in hor horoscopic delineation, and he made, like I said, several trips to India. And um, for those of you, I mean, many of you probably know this, but um, you know, back at the time when these people were practicing, astrology was considered, was actually illegal in many states in the United States and in many countries. It was considered fortune telling, um, a way of taking advantage of people, telling, you know, getting them to invest in things that maybe weren't lucrative and a way of getting rich. But um, Alan Lee, has, I, re I recommend his book. He's got a nice thin, the old one's a nice big green book and it's, you just open it up and right in the, in the beginning of it is, the, the astrological wheel broken down in the 2.5 degree, was it nak, Nakshara's, I'm sorry. I'm not gonna even step into what it is that I don't know, but I mean, it, it's good. it's just like looking kind of like a Western version of, of the Vedic understanding, just really beautiful. And then from Alan Oaken, from his website, he was born in 1944 and majored in Romance languages. He speaks 14 languages. Um, he's the author of dozens of titles, including, of course, Soul Centered Astrology, which is a wonderful, wonderful book for addressing, not addressing, but entering into this realm. He takes Alice's book and, um, and makes it a lot more approachable. It's not so... Um, 
filled with that wonderful Edwardian um, obfuscationism, meaning, you know, using 17 words to describe something that maybe would only take three. Because, you know, their idea was that they were kind of bringing forth the uh, mystery schools again. And they didn't want, there was a real concern on their part that, that they didn't want anyone just to be able to pick up the book and be able to books and read them and be able to understand them and be able to start messing with what they saw as the fundamental energetic blocks of the universe and therefore giving power to someone say like Hitler, um, you know, or other characters like that. So that's kind of like the idea of, you know, why there is a mystery school, why that language is so kind of hard to, to get to. Um, Alan was the director of the Wisdom School here in Santa Fe and the co-founder of the Australian Institute for the Development of Consciousness and the director of esoteric studies at the Kiran Center in Nishboa. Most importantly, as a member of the new group of world servers, as I'm sure many of you are here in this talk today, and a lifelong student of the work and teaching of the Tibetan master Zhuokul and the legacy of the ancient wisdom. And finally, Jeff Green, even though he didn't come out of this lineage, I think it's really important to, um, to include him um, because he brought a deeper meaning and deeper understanding to astrology that is um, definitely caught fire um, way more than I would say the, the Alice Bailey esoteric astrology. So, um, you know, complete kudos on what he's done. Some gorgeous work that he's presented. His Pluto his work on Pluto is, is, is fascinating and, and just spot on as far as what my experience has been. So from his website, um, he's been called the founder of evolutionary astrology because he first started to lecture on the revolutionary astrological paradigm in 1977 after receiving a dream from his spiritual master. In that dream, the entire paradigm of evolutionary astrology was conveyed to him. And he's lectured all over the world since 1977 until 2001. And as uh, many of you know, it's just a, a lot of good information in that teaching. I don't know about you, but one of the first and foremost and important things for me with anything that I look at, I'm sad rising, by the way, um, is I have to experience truth in what it is that I perceive. And so um, what I like is this statement it is at the beginning of his, uh, at the beginning of Alice Bailey's books. And, and they, it's a really important part to remember. Um, the books that I've written are sent out with no claim for their acceptance. They may or may not be correct, true and useful. It is for you to ascertain their truth by right practice and by the exercise of the intuition. Neither I nor Alice A. Bailey is in the least interested in having them acclaimed as inspired writings or in having anyone speak of them with bated breath as being one of the work of the masters. If they present truth in such a way that it follows sequentially upon that already offered in the world teachings, if the information given raises the aspiration and the will to serve from the plane of the emotions to the mind, to that of the mind, the plane whereon the masters can be found, then they will have served their purpose. If the teaching conveyed calls forth a response from your illumined mind <laughs> and brings a flashing forth of this intuition, then let that teaching be accepted, but not otherwise. If the statements meet with eventual corroboration or are deemed true under the test of the law of correspondences, then that is well and good. But should this not be so, let not the student accept what is said. I love this because it's um, it, it, it gives the power back to you as an individual, which is I think where it should always be in these areas. We've um, a lot of uh, religions and cults, our family, and when I talked about, you know, the ways in which we're programmed in society, I mean, there's uh, so sociology in college is, is a great class to take. Um, you can begin to see, like, you know, how we're programmed, the way we're programmed by the media, you know, what's going on in this country right now. Um, it's not about people having any self-responsibility whatsoever about seeing what is true for themselves. And I think that, that serious separation, that, um, that fragmentation of ourselves, you know, which is happening in a lot of different ways. It's our fragmentation from nature. It's our fragmentation from spirit. And so what we have to do is we have to come back to ourselves. We have to come back to connect with ourselves. We have to find out and see what is true. Um, so much of our life, uh, it's funny because, you know, what, as the political stuff's been going on in our country lately, and people have been talking about fake news for the last few years, the truth is, is we're always filled with fake news. 
And it requires us to step up to the plate a little bit and to have some discrimination, to ask some questions, and to not necessarily go along with what someone else says. You know, how do you feel about it? What is it? How does it make, you know, someone might be doing something that might be called right, but if it's making you feel sick to your stomach and you're not, um, and, and it's not making you feel right, you've got to ask yourself what that's about. So I think it's really important. This is, this is the important, the importance of you understanding your in, integrated self and how, and how that works in relationship with this, because it has to, sorry, it has to come together with that. All right. And just like with regular astrology, the birth chart cannot reveal consciousness. You know, when you're looking at a chart, you don't know whether it's the, you know, when a, an animal is born or when it's a child born or when a piece of furniture is made or when the day begins or what. So it's not, you can't ever look at a chart and divine necessarily what level that is operating on or what it is that it's doing. And so it's the same with esoteric astrology. Those of us who were raised with um, Christian backgrounds, I'm actually wouldn't be surprised if this isn't also in some of the other faiths, but there's an old, old saying, it's called on earth as it is in heaven. And in astrology, we say as above, so below. Um, we see this in fractals. Uh, there, there's so many wonderful interlaced ways in which our universe works. Um, and what we see is it's is everything is just ends up being like a microcosm of the macrocosm. As it is here, so it's being represented above, so it's being represented above. Love this Serbian proverb. Be humble for you are made of earth. Be noble for you are made of stars. So we have our galaxy. We have our solar system, we have our planet, and then we have us. All of this is all made up of the same material. <laughs> there's, there's nothing that differentiates. That you, sure, there might be minerals that are different, there might be different composites, but the thing is, is that this is, we are all in the same fishbowl. You know, this galaxy is, is one humongous fishbowl of amazing permutations. One of the important things to understand with esoteric astrology or esoteric, the esoteric belief in, in regardless um, is this interesting idea of matter and spirit. Hey, Michael. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a question that just came in. Who made, who wrote that statement? I think it was the, maybe the last. The Serbian statement, the yeah, proverb. I what they're referring right. I just saw that as a proverb when I when I put it in the the sacred oracle of the internet um it said it was a Serbian proverb great if, if oh, I'm not said, happy to change that so please if someone catches me I'm happy to, to change that but from what I understand it's it's something that has been a you know an, a, an ongoing saying which is what proverbs okay. usually say. thank she you she just said I was I was know the preface of the book oh the preface or preface of the book Preface of the book. Oh, on this part. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you. That's even better. I appreciate. It. That's why I love that we can. Okay, so yeah. Um, yeah. So this is, as you can kind of tell by it, it's it's actually Joel Cool. So this is, you know, this is something that he shared with Alice Bailey telepathically, and she has at the very beginning of her book. So this is quote the master. That's the other thing that's really, you know, kind of lovely about this is there's this way of, you know, he presents himself. He never presents himself really as a master and doesn't call himself that, but others call him that. Um, and what I find with this is, is there ends up being a little bit that since there is this hierarchical thing, you know, there is this kind of sometimes this master kind of thing with it. But, you know, I think it depends on how you how you want to take it. But, yeah, these are the words of Joel Cool or, or DK, as they call him. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. So in sold matter, I mean, as you can probably tell right away, this is also the Star of David. Um, it's the idea that everything in our galaxy, everything that we see, everything we don't see, everything we know we don't know is 
either spirit, which is matter at its least densest form, or matter, which is spirit at its most densest form. And the way they come together, we're, we're a little bit more of an embodiment of that. Um, not that anything else isn't, everything else is, but we're actually working with a little bit more of bringing also the intelligence and, and operating with this energy in a certain way. But the truth is that everything that you know, everything that you see actually has consciousness. I have to, I have to say this, it's, it's still my thing that I'm still sitting with after all these years, but um, thinking of plastic as being consciousness is, I'm still having a hard time with that. So yeah, we call it insold matter. Um, Sri Aurobindo um, and the mother speak of this a lot. For those of you who know about Sri Aurobindo, um, there, there are various teachings over the ages that have this understanding of, uh, of us being insold, um, insold beings, incarnated. The idea of incarnate is to go into the meat. It's in meat. Our soul is in meat. It's conscious meat. That's what our bodies are. <laughs> so, um, so to understand a little bit, we're going to step now into what the seven rays are. And the idea is, is that it comes from what are called the seven stars of the giant dipper or Ursa Major, you know, the big bear. Um, originating stars are Al-Qaeda, Mizar, Alioth, which make up the big dipper's handle, Migraz, Fecta, Dube, and Merit are the bowl. So if you think of each of those, um, each of those individual stars being there, they each basically send out a ray of energy. Each of them cover three individual rays each, to, I mean, to each sign. So each, each ray rules, has coverage over three different signs, except for, yeah, no, that's right, three for each. So you see three red, three white, three yellow, three blue, three green, three orange, and three purple. And so then these rays transmit, these, the rays that are coming from the starlight are transmitted through our zodiacal constellations, the 12 that we know. And then they are reflected by our sun. Our sun is what's called, is, our sun is known as a second ray entity, meaning it is about love and wisdom. So it means that actually our whole solar system here um, is a second ray solar system. So when you think about it, the, the light's coming through from the starlight, coming through the constellations, hitting our sun, bouncing off our sun, bouncing then off the planets, because the planets, in order for us to see the planets, are reflecting the light back from the sun. They're reflecting it onto us here. You are here. So it's, that's kind of an interesting, you know, it's also, when you think about it, it's also in a way how the zodiac works in a sense. But this is like, if you think about where the fixed stars, it's this idea that this energy is, is coming through and imbuing each one of the signs. It kind of gives us a different understanding of each of the zodiacal signs. And I like to think of the seven rays as being our rainbow. They, you know, it's, it's the building block of, of the universe. Um, this is a picture I got to take. Uh, when we were at UAC, was that only last year? <laughs> in Chicago last year um, in May, it was on the lake, Lake Michigan. So what is a ray? A ray is, can be considered a particular type of divine quality or energy. It is an energy which infuses both spirit and form. As I said before, everything we see, know, and can't see, and can't know, and don't see, and don't know. They're the builders or the building blocks of everything that exists. They're divine expression. And as I said before, the, the seven rays are like the, the rainbows and, and you know, the seven bands, the different colors in the rainbow. And it's about making up the many different bands, which then make up one. Our physical, emotional, intellectual, and spirit selves are composed of the various rays, sometimes singular and oftentimes in multiple combinations. So the seven rays are broken up into two different parts. Um, esoteric astrology and, and, and the esoteric teachings in general have a lot to do with numerology, um, ancient teachings, ancient understandings. So, um, we can kind of see these, these building blocks, the building blocks of three, four, seven, and 12. So we start with the original three. Um, we can kind of think about as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But um, in this instance, fortunately, there isn't any sort of a, um, 
a um, gender thing attached to it. So we're just going to look at them as far as their energetics and what they mean. So the first set of three are considered the rays of aspect. The first ray of aspect is called the ray of will or the will to love. This is a, um, a very forceful, strong energy. It's, it's what gets things done. It's represented by volcanoes. Um, you know, that, kind, that primal chthonic, you know, that force that comes out from, from the root of, of, of existence and, and sprays forth. That, that's a will, that's a willpower, that's a force, you know, force of nature. Gandhi was an example of it. Um, his will, when he did his, um, oh God, it just slipped into my head, civil disobedience, um, they're uh, having the will to do that. It's a passive thing that he was doing in a sense of sitting there and doing that, but his strength, his presence of holding that place and not moving was actually the will part. So it was, may have appeared passive, but it wasn't. It was, it was holding his energy in a, in a clear and defined space. Adolf Hitler was a first ray individual. Um, he could not have accomplished what he did without having that will, that drive, so to speak. So you can also see um, as we go through this that um, the energies, these rays, um, use whatever is available. Um, the energy, when you think of the energy of the universe, it doesn't perceive itself as being evil or, or bad or good or anything like that. It just simply is. So as it is used, that is, as it is being defined or filtered through the individual personality, we end up with, you know, as shown by these two individuals, um, very different experiences and expressions of, of what will the first ray of uh, will looks like. Ray two, which is what our universe, our solar system, sorry, is all about. There are other solar systems out there and they have different energetics about them. Um, the energy about is the yellow. I forgot, sorry, I should have said that about the color. Blue is the color for ray one. Yellow is the color for ray two. Um, yellow is a little bit more on that wisdom side when you think about it, for those of you who kind of understand about with colors. Um, but love, you know, getting that place of love, wisdom. This is an interesting part because I've, I've, I've gone to a couple of different talks on um, with esoteric groups, um, the Seven Rays group in Arizona for one, and a lot of people like to talk about being of love, wisdom, and what I find is a lot of them end up being a lot more on the wisdom side, and I think the love part tends to be lacking. And Kind of like how I can kind of tell the difference between the love wisdom is um, the coloring of a person. Um, I mean, if you live in Seattle, I mean, you can't really help it. If you live in northern climes, it's one thing. But, you know, there's there's a vibrancy to the person. Um, th but there's also people who are more scholar. Like, I don't know, I'm not meaning to say any kind of judgment thing about it. But, you know, there, there's a different way when one's operating from their love, their heart center versus operating from more of a mental plane. And um, our physical bodies show that show that easily. Madonna and child is a perfect example of love wisdom, the unconditional love that a mother feels um, when a baby's born, um, when their baby's born, and, and that tie is never removed. Um, as long as that child's alive, as long as the mother's alive, that bond is always gonna be there. Roses in the heart, of course, are a symbol of the second ray. Kuan Yin, goddess of mercy. Uh, she is the bodhisattva who is who has made the pledge to remain until the last human passes from physical form into spirit form. That's 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 a huge commitment. That's that's quite an exceptional amount of um, of compassion and love. <laughs> really beautiful. It's a very sophisticated goal, I would say, for 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 one's spiritual becoming. The third and final ray of aspect is, is called active intelligence. A spider's web is an example of that. Um, you know, it has to do with ideas. It has to do with um, thought forms. St. Thomas Aquinas, I love this line. Uh, to one who has no faith, no explanation is necessary. To one without faith, no explanation is possible. There's wonderful old Catholic koans. <laughs> And Bertrand Russell, which is wonderful, it's a nice counterpoint to, to, um, to Aquinas' uh, quote. There is something feeble and a little contemptible about a man who cannot face the perils of life without the help of comfortable myths. 
you know, these are the things we get trapped in our minds and the considerations, you know, how we conceive things, how we perceive things. A lot of, um, a, a, a lot of what, how we perceive the world comes from this third ray. You know, it's, it's where we get caught up in our ideas that aren't really what the realities of things. It, it shows us the power of that, that third ray energy. And the fourth, the next four rays are what are called the rays of attribute. And the rays of attribute are actually all based on combinations of the first three rays. Um, this is going to be, I mean, this is, you're getting kind of a crash course of understanding of this here today. But um, when I give the first talk, I'll be talking about, there's one whole workshop just for the rays alone, and we'll be delving with them and understanding them a lot more. So, you know, these, this, this talk is being recorded. You're going to be able to come back to this and listen to it. Um, so it's just really kind of a brief overview for each of these and how they build up or what we call the blended rays. So if you take the rays on the left-hand side, they make the rays on the right-hand side. So if you take ray one and ray two, the ray of will and the ray of love, and you put them together, you get what's called the fourth ray, which is harmony through conflict. Harmony through conflict is this very interesting. It's very human. Um, the idea is that we have to kind of exhaust ourselves, almost like what I said in the beginning, as far as we, we kind of have to go through like maybe five chapters to learn our lesson. Um, it, it's learning it over and over again to realize like, hey, you know, I really don't want to go through that again. You know, those of us who have had relationships that are painful and difficult and, and you have enough of them that after a while you go like, mm, you know, I don't, I, I think I'm full. I don't think I need to have this experience anymore. That's, that's a fourth ray experience. Fifth ray is a different sort of knowledge. Um, it's a different sort of intelligence than the third ray, but it takes the first ray and of will and the third ray of active intelligence, and it gives what's called concrete knowledge. Concrete knowledge is, is basically taking, you know, when you think about it, if you take will and you take idea and you put the two together, I mean, that's an inventor, right? I mean, it's taking that idea and, and making it happen. So it's concrete knowledge. It's, it's, it's that tool. It's, it's, well, we'll show a lot of it. Like it's a lab, it's a microscope. You know, it's these things that help us do more because of the of what it's created. Our sixth ray is what's known as devotion and idealism. Um, <clears throat> that is the ray when you take the ray uh, of love, wisdom, the second ray, and the third ray, and you combine those two. Um, in order to, you know, it's good to have love, but you know, when you put that forth with an idea. Um, that can be really incredible. Like the Crusades are an example of, of the sixth ray, you know, going forth, you know, Christian soldiers. That's a, that's a, a kind of a sixth ray energy. Or any kind of soldiers, actually. That's not, not just relegated to the Christians. And finally, the seventh ray is, is, um, is the one that kind of pulls it all together. It's the seventh ray. It's considered the, the ray of ceremonial order or the ray of synthesis. And that's a little more of a sophisticated ray, and, and it actually is built up upon three individual rays, the first ray, second ray, and third ray. So it gives one the, um, it's, it's kind of like having the, uh, the Holy Trinity in your pocket. It's like, you know, okay, it, it, the Alpha and the Omega. It's just this way of being able to like understand a great range of, so it's like, it's like having, a series of dictionaries and encyclopedias and not only understanding that in the dictionary it's all about words and in the encyclopedias it's about themes and larger ideas but it's about taking all of that and understanding there's a greater context that actually holds all of that together that is synthesis <laughs> so um examples of the fourth ray um harmony through conflict i love this For two people are talking together and the first person says damn are you a newspaper the person says, no, why? And the, second, and the first person says, because there's a new issue with you every day. There's always something going on. This is a fourth ray. I mean, there's always, I mean, all of us, um, we, some of us have periods in our lives that are this way. Some of us are this way our whole lives. Some of us don't ever live this way. Um, our 20s are a great time of this. Teenage times are this. You know, it's just there's there's some new drama that's going on. Actually, actually, this year's been that way. It's, a, it's definitely a fourth ray year, to be honest. We're all learning to find some way through this amazing chaos that we've all been enduring this year. It's the seesaw. But not to be confused with Libra, by the way. It's a very different energy in that sense. Shakespeare, when you think of William Shakespeare, um, he was able to capture 
human nature in a way that showed us our foibles, our fears, our strengths, our insecurities, but also our redeeming value that happens to going through them. I um, mean, considering, you know, that his, his works are some, you know, almost 500 years old, it's, it's, it's wonderful that, you know, we're still kind of all operating on that level. <laughs> the fifth ray is considered concrete knowledge. One of the key words for it is called detachment. Computers are a great example. I and mean, when you think about it in the beginning, the first ray with, with being, um, hey, Michael. Lab. Yes. Oh, I have a, a question for you. Please. Um, how do I find out my rays? We will get into that in a little bit, if that's okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So um, a computer is a good example of, of, of the fifth ray. If you think of the um, spider web in the first one and the internet, you know, the internet actually would kind of be like a combination of the first and fifth ray, but the fifth ray includes the first and the third, so um, which makes sense on how that works. A laboratory, as I said earlier. It's, it's taking those ideas. Tesla is a, is a great example of, of a fifth ray individual, um, glowing individual, and how wonderful that we live in a time to see a lot more of his work being put into practice. Sixth ray, loving devotion. Joan of Arc is um, someone from the from the past who is a perfect example of loving devotion. She was unfaltering in her belief of what her truth was in her devotion to God. Dogs, it's my uh, old Weimar honor before she passed away a few years ago, um, are a perfect example. Of, um, anyone who has a dog um, or a horse or any kind of an animal, cats kind of are in their own little category. Cats, some cats can kind of fit in this category, but you know, when you come home, no matter what kind of day you've had, no matter what kind of day they've had, they're just happy to see you. They love you. Um, they're in the moment. The Crusades, as I said earlier, were an example of loving devotion. Billy Graham. His work was all about loving devotion. Seventh ray is loving synthesis. Rainbow, of course, is going to be a representation of that. Thomas Jefferson, the work he did to help form our country. Merlin, the magician, whether actual or not, represents that aspect, that understanding of how everything needs to work together, that, um, that there are costs to doing things that aren't right. He tried to get Arthur to understand that, but it wasn't really that Sorry, easy. Sorry, Michael, another question. Yep. Um, ray five color, is it green or orange? Oh, thank you, yeah. Uh, ray five green. Thank you. Ray, ray six purple, and seven is um, lavender. Thank you for that, for reminding me of that. A wand is a great thing like that, you know, holding that, you know, wisdom, understanding how to work with that in an appropriate way and using it magically to create something that is true. Um, this is a nice little example of a chart of kind of like where we're operating. Um, I was able to, when I was working with Alan, was able to take one of his workbooks and, and remake it. And fortunately, he's, um, I said it'd be okay for him to use it, and he said it was okay for me to use it, so it makes it really nice. We're, this is us kind of right here. This is the physical form. And you see here's soul up here in form here. This is a very kind of like a sophisticated thing. Everything, like I said earlier on, in esoteric and, and work is, is kind of broken down in these levels of seven. And so we have our physical body, the etheric body, the next level is our emotional body that kind of blankets it, and then our mental body. These are almost like little energetic sheaths that wrap around our, our system. Then outside of it, and then it, of course, this represents here's the physical level, seventh, uh, six levels, astral, fifth levels, lower mental. So this is our embodied part. Then there's something called the Antakarana, which is also known as the Rainbow Bridge. And this is the, um, the Intersection space, this is where we connect up with our higher selves, we connect in with the higher higher mental, the intu intuitional, the soul, the atma, all that, which is really great. So just a little bit of a kind of a fun overview if you kind of wondered how that looks. So one of the little treats I'm going to give you today is a little formula on how to find a little bit about your soul's purpose. And what it has to do is it has to do with what your ascendant is. So whatever sign your ascendant is and the rule, the rays that rule it 
are going to be a lot about what your focus is in this lifetime. So if you take the esoteric ruler of the ascendant and say, like in my case, it's Sagittarius, um, is ruled by rays four, five, and six. Um, I don't know why I put in the, oh, in the house, first house. Um, so, because that's usually where the ascendant is. Um, it it, it kind of shows that then, you know, for me, what my life is really about is this fourth, fifth, and sixth ray, harmony through conflict, um, concrete knowledge, and, um, and loving devotion. Um, here I am, you know, teaching this this higher knowledge through uh, through electronic devices, um, helping people to find their way, and devoted to a higher higher calling. There's a little more to that topic, but you know, this is a free talk, so I can't give away too much on my little talk. <laughs> and let me see what else we do. Oh, and one of the, let's see, actually a couple other things. One is um, there are two planets that are new or quote in addition in um, esoteric astrology one is the planet vulcan it exists somewhere between mercury and the sun whether it is an actual planet or whether it is an esoteric or just an energetic planet really isn't is, is kind of not as is material based on it but it's something that has to do with it's kind of like a higher octave of pluto so it has to do with about a destruction of ego destruction of attachment because when we think about um, spirit, spirit can't hold on to physical things. Um, we like to say, you know, the esoteric teachings are about learning to become personal to the impersonal and impersonal to the personal. So there are things like Vulcan and Pluto, which are about destroying our attachments to things, um, learning that our attachments are what get us in the way of maybe seeking our highest good. And then surprisingly enough, the other planet, which it's going to make a lot more sense to you as soon as I say it, is Earth. Something that we, you know, we stand on every day that we don't really speak to in traditional astrology. But um, the Earth is always found 180 degrees opposite wherever your sun is. So, um, and it kind of helps you make sense, you know, for those of us who have a hard time accepting people whose sign, sun sign is up opposing ours, that's because they're playing a bit of a role in helping us to see kind of where we need to be. So every time you, you know, any of you who are, you know, Pisces and you see a Virgo that's irritating you, it's probably usually the other way around, <laughs> realize that, you know, that person's kind of showing you your dharma. Kind of showing what you need to do and it makes kind of sense you know for a virgo virgo needs to look across at pisces and go hey you know maybe i should just take a little a day off maybe i should go and soak in the hot tub and have a glass of wine and enjoy myself and relax and not worry if the house is a mess for the day or you know or go and meditate and every once in a while pisces needs to look across the way and go hey you know it might be good for me to like clean up the house and and do the things that they need to do to get the processes going. It kind of helps, again, this is what I'm talking about. Esoteric astrology is really great at kind of adding a little bit of a balance, adding a nuanced um, complexity to an understanding of astrology that you already have. So as I say these things, I hope I, I hope it's making sense to people. Michael, a quick question, yep. two quick yep. questions, yep. if that's okay. Um, one of them was, I'm assuming it's, um, since it's esoteric, it's traditional, but they asked, is it traditional rulership? No, it's a whole it's a whole different set. Well, I should say it's not a whole different set. Most of the signs have a different set of rulers. The, there are two, uh -huh. let's see, Capricorn is ruled esoterically by Saturn as as well as on the personality level, and Scorpio is ruled by Mars esoterically and exoterically. So I'll give ah. a little, I didn't, I didn't, I, I have in the past I've given it, but I think this ends up being such a heady talk. And so I, I want to kind of keep it a little lighter, but yeah. So an example would be for Aries, the traditional ruler, of course, for Aries is Mars. Esoterically, it's Mercury. Wow. When you think about it, when, when, you know, the, when instinctual Aries has the ability to not operate from um, desire and also instinctually oriented Mars, and it's able to go into that neutral place of Mercury and think about it for itself for a moment, it comes up with a whole different rationale about how to look at things. Yeah. 
So that's just one small example, and, and each one of them has that. And that's what I mean about these nuances. It, it kind of helps. The other thing that I really like about it is there's ways of looking at, you know, I have to say right off the bat, I don't believe anyone has a bad chart. I don't believe anyone has bad aspects. I don't believe in any kind of that. I'm sorry, I'm going to call it BS because I see it as BS. If you have something in your chart, you're here to be the artisan. You're here to be the creator of how those energies work. And what I like about esoteric astrology is it can lend a, a, give you an idea of like whether part of what's going on for you is a fight between your personality self and your spiritual self. I mean, you might come into this lifetime, you know, let's use our present, our, our present example, our president as an example, he's very much an exoterically personality based oriented person. He's not worrying about what's going on for his soul. He's not worrying about, you know, what, what the karma is and what the dharma is in life. He's just being himself out there in the world. And that's, that's how he's going to be operating. Mm -hmm. What, um, so will you go into the rulerships more deeply in your workshops? Is that? Yes, I will. So that'll happen when I talk about, um, I think it happens actually in the sign. So it'll be in the third workshop, but I'll probably touch on it a little bit. Also, just to let you know, I mean, just like, I don't know, probably so many of you who have learned astrology, please, you know, go online. I mean, there's some amazing, amazing resources. When you have these questions, just go on. You know, as soon as you have that question, type it in and look it up and see what it is and see how it resonates. But, or get the esoteric, you know, Bailey's Esoteric Astrology Book or Alan's book. And it really helps build an understanding. I hope you'll take the class, of course. The workshop is going to be a lot of fun. And um, I, sorry, uh, last question. I, we're at a little bit over at two, so I hope it's okay. I, oh, yeah. I personally want to know, so I guess this is a twofold question, but um, say someone has a planet in their first house, that's the first part of it. And then um, what would that mean? And then like, also like if someone has a planet in their first house with whole sign, but not in another, another house system, like how do you, how do the, how do the esoteric astrology, like how does that determine things? How does that change things? Such a great question because it um, it um, everything kind of has a layering to it. So there's the natural dial which places Aries as being you know the the natural starting the first house whether where however you see the first house as being um, whole sign or any of the other other house systems and then plays out. So because of that, there's an inherent because Aries is a first and seventh ray. Um, sign there's an inherent first and seventh ray energy to that so there's that's always going to underlie it so if you have that but then say you have maybe a virgo um let's see let's make it really simple let's um say it is oh my gosh i'm having a bad time um something oh, so so you'd have that and then whatever the actual sign is you have in that then whatever rays those are and then there's the rays of the planets themselves and so what you really want to do sometimes it's it's just chaos sometimes it's like you're not going to see something but sometimes you'll end up seeing like wow in this sign over here not only do i have a sign that has this particular ray on it but it also has a planet with that ray in it too mm -hmm. so then you're going to see that there's going to be a focusing of that energy of how that mm -hmm. plays out so it's again it's this layering and that's why it's you know i really like taking this time like i'm going to be doing the workshops where people can build on each one because it takes a little while for to kind of rest and sit into it because it's i i still kind of like wake up in the middle of the night sometimes going oh my god does that mean that and and, it, and yeah. the way it fits in with one another it's just so beautifully nuanced this is exciting i'll definitely be in the workshops myself oh, so <laughs> i hope you all will too yeah, I'm I'm glad I'm looking forward to it. Whoever wants to come, I'm excited to have it. It's really reasonable, $35 a pop. So um should make it pretty simple. This is an art piece that I'm working on right now. The Ouroboros and the four phases of the moon and the turtle carrying the earth. And you know, it's like letting letting spirit come through, you know, finding ways. So again, you know, we have the, the four workshops you're gonna be um the rays are gonna be on Saturday, October 31st. You can take one. You can take all four. Um, they're they're going to be set up as basically standalone. There's going to be a little bit of weave in. I'd probably encourage people who don't have any understanding of it to take all four of them, but you know that's completely up to you. Second one Saturday, 21st of this, uh, November. 
Third one on the signs is Saturday the 5th of December. Then the soul centered houses, January 16th. And then I'll probably be doing something on esoteric aspects so you can understand how those are and show them. And we can, we'll be talking about those. I won't ever hesitate to answer people's questions in workshops and classes and things, um, provided they don't get too, too personal, but something where it is also able to be relational for other people to learn from as well. That's kind of how I, I look at these opportunities. Um, and, and identifying the sole purpose and understanding delineation and synthesis. And that's where it gets into a little more of a, a, a sophisticated level of understanding. Um, let's see. As Kaylin said in the beginning, um, this is a free webinar and I, I hope if you got any kind of value out of it, um, I really would love if you even dropped $5 into the, into the donation to the kitty for Kepler College. They've got a great, you know, great scholarship program. They've also got the diversity scholarship program. I'm personally giving money every month for that because I think it's so valuable to um, help diversify our community, not make it so white and male as it has been, but get the beautiful rainbow colors across our astrological community and the wealth of experience and, and beauty and knowledge and wisdom that we all have to share in this group. It's just, I'm, I'm so honored to be a part of this community and thank you all for this opportunity. Every week, if you want to listen, um, my friend Marilyn LeBlanc, a fellow Aquarian sun and Scorpio moon like myself, we do a we weekly podcast. It's available on YouTube, it's called Deep Dives with New Perspectives, Deep Dives being our Scorpio moon, New Perspectives being our Aquarius suns. Um, we talk about various topics. Please feel free to subscribe, sign up, share, give to your friends, leave comments, share ideas that you want us to talk about. Also, this last year, I finished a book um, called Astrological Mavericks. Do you have what it takes to change the world? It's a book about people who have planets born with planets on the angles, one of the four angles, the ascendant, descendant, IC, or MC. It's an amazing and wonderful, if I may say so, reference book for people to understand the nuances of astrology. It, it takes each planet through each sign and gives 48 different explanations and gives um, little snippets of information, whether it was quotes a person made, uh, movies they've done, songs they've some um, lives they've lived, people who we just know unmistakably and how they've changed the world just simply by being themselves. It's, it's a really great um, resource tool for people with astrology, available on Kindle, Amazon, Apple Book, and through your bookstore if you, log on, if you give them the ISBN. And that's all I came with to talk and I'm happy to spend as much time answering questions as people wish. Great, we do have some time left over. So I'll wait for these questions to roll in. I guess I have some questions, but I'm I'm kind of just feeling like I need to, because they're personal questions, so I have to wait and maybe get that book and attend the workshop. Um, so yeah, it's hard for me to, to think about how to apply what I'm asking generally, I guess. Um, okay, I guess, so let's say like, like um, building off of the question I asked, let's say someone has that additional planet in their first house and they, so you have like, okay, I have. All right, give me, get, let's make it really fun and just give me the real. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I have um, Aries rising with Jupiter uh, in the first house. Okay. So I'm looking at like, okay, the first, the seventh and the second ray. Yep. And trying to figure out, okay, how do I blend those things? It's it's interesting because it's like thinking about, I'm also in um, 104, everyone, which is a foundational, or no, sorry, I'm in movement, which uh, 115, and we're learning right now about progressions and like, I'm learning, okay, this is how, like right now I'm progressed to Gemini and the ascendant. And then I'm also looking at this information and it's like, okay, how do I, <laughs> How do I digest, like someone said, lots of digest, yes. How do I digest all of this and incorporate the rays into my current understanding of, of astrology? Um, it's huge. I mean, first of all, I would have to say that it um, allow the information to come in how it comes in. Um, when I first started learning about this, the first few times I picked up Alice Bailey's books, I started reading them and I'd read a paragraph and I'd put it down. I'd read a paragraph, I'd put it down, read a paragraph, put it down. And then finally, like 
you know, I just give up. And then a few years later, when I, Alan and I were started working together, he said, here's Serving Humanity. I want you to read it. I did the same thing. I read it. I put it down. I read it. I put it down. And finally, to be honest, the third time I threw it away because I was like, oh my God, what, what a bunch of BS. <laughs> what a bunch of malarkey, you know, having all this kind of like, blah, it's all this blah, 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 kind of, you know, the way they speak and, you know, it's so, um, challenging and then um he was out here for santa fe for his 70th and he did a workshop and included an, a, a talk on the wisdom teaching and literally something opened up in my head when he was talking and it, it literally like acted as a key um mm. in my understanding and so now i understand it a lot better i don't i do not profess to be an expert um as, as so many of us in this we just say we're all students we're, we're all students in this teaching right. and learning about it but so I would say with that, yeah, this, you're exactly right. With the Aries, it's the first and seventh ray. Jupiter is second ray, so you got those first three together. The other thing you can do is wherever your Mercury is, your Mercury is going to be the esoteric ruler of your mm -hmm. ascendant. Okay. And you can look at what how your relationship is with your Mercury and your Mars, basically the relationship between your esoteric ruler and your exoteric ruler, and you can kind of see how easy or how hard or whether it might be even a non-issue about letting that higher octave of your Aries energy operate. It's funny because I think I actually, when I was describing Aries particularly, and I said the Mercury thing, I think I heard you exhale or inhale. I don't know. I, don't, I was on mute, but maybe you like psychically picked up on me. <laughs> I, I felt something. It's funny because, like, I, I so it's funny when you say that because I actually kind of felt energetically. I mean, it makes sense that you know that you had that sort of an experience because, <laughs> like, it, like when I heard that, I was like, oh, what a relief for Aries. <laughs> it, yeah, it absolutely is. Um, it gives because I think the traditional like, oh, Aries, you know, it it, it doesn't allow for that um, reflection uh, of that yeah. Mercury. And and I have some other questions coming in too, so I don't want to. I want to make sure they get answered. Um, okay, so someone's asking, do the rays also apply to events or just natal charts? They they apply to anything and everything. So I mean, you can kind of see what um, kind of what the rays. I mean, just like you know, whatever's rising, you know, as the ascendant, you can look at as far as like what rays are being presented. Um, for those of us, you know, what's fun, you know playing with astrology sometimes is sit there and you if you're with a group of people which is a little more challenging nowadays but you know to all of a sudden you realize the energy changes and you realize that the that it's because the ascendants change signs and then you can also maybe start tracking that as far as how the rays would also present themselves in that same regard okay and do okay so here's another question do the rays like i know um so there's the planetary hours and a planet like you know a planet represents each hour or rules each hour does the same thing apply with the rays like can it represent different times of the day i don't i don't see any reason why not i mean i would just basically take the the rays um um and and lay it over i mean you can go online and get a look i was actually i used to have the table on here and i'm sorry i didn't leave the table on here i think it was trying trying to make more of a tease to get people to <laughs> to sign up but yeah, um, usually I give like a nice overview sheet that does it. But yeah, that's a, that's a great way to look at it. Okay. And then the next one is, let's see, would you say the soul's purpose is a combination of the ascendant and sun signs rays influences? I would kind of say that. What I'd say is it's kind of like looking at, let's see, how would I say this? Um, kind of like looking at what your soul has decided to focus on this lifetime is the ascendant the sun is the engine not too different in the sense of what it is exoterically um the sun plays a part of kind of like how that ego is going to shine out how how your um how your egoic solar energy your battery is actually going to show up and the interesting thing is, you know, the moon tends to be obviously the, the next strongest one in traditional astrology, but in esoteric astrology, we call it a dead planet. And when you think about it, if you remember back when I said that um, we are looking to become more personal to the impersonal and impersonal to the personal, 
then we can kind of see that the goal is not about attachment. I mean, I have a Scorpio moon. If you want to talk about emotional attachments, <laughs> it's probably one of the hardest things is to learn is, you know, is letting go of those, letting go of those things that, you know, that catch us, that trigger us, that literally trip us up. So yeah, that's, 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 you're, you're pretty close on it with how you're looking at it. Okay. And, and then I would add, just add to that maybe a little bit. It's, because the the sun can kind of be seen as that like vehicle for the soul so in that way maybe the person maybe that answers this, like kind of i don't know i don't know if i'm on with um i'm no i actually like that thank you because actually that is more the word that was hitting in my head and i and i meant to say that and so thank you for saying that because it didn't it isn't what came out but it is it's like the vehicle it's like, it's the engine it's that um it's that um gosh it's you know it's 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 kind of like this emblem I've got here, my uh, the 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 labyrinth at Shard. It's just it's that thing that um, that is seen and operates, and and it's you know it's like your heart. Like it's it's kind it's kind of, actually I would say it's kind of like it's like your your energetic heart in a sense operating system. I love that. So in that way, then um, then you, the answer to this person's question is then yes, it could be the sole purpose or the purpose shining through with that vehicle and i don't know I well don't i mean know. what you'll see is like especially you know like you know especially for those of us who are fortunate to have a son that is um that is in a supportive aspect to our ascendant then you can see how that kind of that literally like shines the light on or pours the light on or if it's in a challenging aspect you can see like how it might be that there's going to be that the ego has to go through some permutations so that it is able to actually shine out and do the soul work you know, that's that's kind of how I look at it. Great. So, so the next question is, when looking at the ascendant ruler of, so they're talking about exoteric, not esoteric, do you use the traditional ruler or modern rulers or co-rulers? I use both. Um, I'm an Aquarius son, as I said before, um, and, and what I've known over the years that is if, if and for myself as well as any other Aquarian is if I try and either focus on just the Iranian side or just the Saturnian side, I'm missing 50% of the Aquarian. Mm -hmm. With the Neptunian, if I just focus on the Neptune or the Jupiter, I'm, I'm going to be missing another, another part of it. Sometimes, I mean, like with Pisces, especially, I think is Jupiter and Neptune, there, there's a certain kind of an energetic harmonic, so it kind of understands. But Aquarius, I think, is like one that easy, one of the most wonderful ones because you know, we we can be so nasty and petty and and constricted and fixed in our little ideas when we get stuck on something as Aquarians. But then we also have this amazing ability to pop out of ourselves thanks to Uranus and do and just go like, oh well, that that's great, but uh, we've got to get rid of it. It doesn't work anymore. Oh, I don't want to be stuck with that. So it's that you know, those those last three signs are are a whole different you know order of business when it comes to to astrology. So it's it's. Yeah, I, I think it's important to look at both of them. And then, you know, of course, because we're talking about esoterically, is I actually look at then the exoteric ruler, the traditional exoteric ruler, the modern exoteric ruler, and then the esoteric rulers, and then see how that plays out. Then there's another factor that plays into it is, you know, does a person have a planet conjunct the ascendant? If a person has a planet right close to the ascendant, that planet, if it's not related, if it's not a ruling planet, that planet i mean meaning say if it's an air you know if it's if you're like for you kaylin aries being a, uh, your rising sign if it's a planet other than mars or mercury on the ascendant then yeah. a lot of times i like to see that i see that planet as a ruling planet my book is really about that anyway astrological Ma mavericks anyone who has planet conjunct an angle that planet is 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 running the way show. more than you're giving it credit for <laughs> Right. Yeah. So yeah, for me, it'd be Jupiter and that, uh, you know, the, the leader. Um, right. okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, you lead with your heart when you lead, you know, when you come from that place of generosity, when you come from that place of love wisdom in your leadership role, I mean, it's just like how you introduced the talk this morning. I mean, it's, it's a very, it's a very beautiful, grand energy. It's very, um, it's very inclusive. It's very generous. It's, 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 um, it's, a, it's a compliment. It's a beautiful yeah. thing. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoy. I enjoy bringing people together, and and it lights me up to to talk about these things with with everyone. I, you know, I can't wait for the workshops. Yeah. And 
where we can be interactive and I'm not just reading your all, all of your questions on the screen. Um, <laughs> next question is about Scorpio. Just what is, what Ray rules Scorpio? So as you know, as you can kind of imagine, Scorpio, Scorpio and Taurus are both fourth ray signs. Um, it's interesting. It's one of the few polarities that are have the both have the same ray on each side, and it, and it kind of makes sense. It's um, Scorpio and Taurus are um, they're formidable, formidable in um, in 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 so many ways, and. Um, uh, one of my favorite lines was something that Aaron Sullivan has, has said for many years. It's a dear friend of mine, and, and I just love when she says it. It's like, Scorpio, and I, and I think, to be honest, Taurus, and, and I would put fixed uh, uh, Aquarius and Leo in there as well. Um, mm -hmm. We have to get tired of ourselves. We have to get sick and tired of ourselves. Kind of like what I said before with the drama, you know, fourth ray. Scorpio, I mean, those. I have a Scorpio moon. Um, our relationships are... Um, are very uncomfortable for other people because we're willing to go to places, we're willing to say things, we're willing to do things, we're willing, because the feeling is so intense. And I think that's even, you know, when it comes to the esoteric side, it's even, it, it helps because it helps kind of temper, it helps understand. And Scorpio is another one of those signs. It's very interesting. Scorpio is ruled um, in the traditional sense by Mars. The modern day is Pluto and esoteric gets back to Mars again. So, in the esoteric sense, what I like about that is it's it's taking Scorpio's desire nature, because those of us who have that Scorpio side, I'm sure the person who's asking this is probably a very strong Scorpionic person. Um, we're very desire based. We're very um, we're very much want things that we want the way we want them and how we want them, and we're always saddened and disappointed and and hurt by the ways that things don't happen with it. But when that Mars turns from being a self um, self desire feeling fe filling energy and becomes a, a an energetic ability to um, to pierce things when you think about when you look at the glyph of Mars it's you know it's 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 the circle with the with the arrow sticking out you know kind of like Sagittarius also you know people say like the male phallus but it inserts itself it creates space so Mars from that standpoint is going in there and saying you know Scorpio doesn't feel like it has space Scorpio feels like it has to hide under a rock because it can't be seen its feelings are too big we're too intense all that kind of stuff and that Mars then switches it from that kind of intensity and just goes oh this is where I need to insert myself because I'm here to create transformation. I am here to create a place for people to um, to go through the process of death and rebirth and release and standing into that place. The releasing of the skin, the Ouroboros, these are the powerful things that you know the scorpionic energy does on the esoteric level. And that's that's only if uh, the 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 um, desire to to hold on to you know things and like lifts somehow. Um, yeah, the Scorpio Moon can be a a tricky situation. <laughs> Kudos is, to you know, you for working I'll, with it. <laughs> yeah, and you know it's interesting because. What, the one other thing that I like about it is esoteric astrology also has a place for all the detriment and fall placements. And when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. All the detriment and fall does is it creates a challenging way. It, it's not easy for the personality. So I have an Aquarius sun. You know, that means my sun is in its fall and I've got a Scorpio moon. It's in its detriment. Um, but that means that I kind of have to work again? all Sorry, that. Sorry, what was your sun sign? Or your your rising? Uh, Aquarius. Aquarius Sun. Well, right. What was your rising? Oh, Sag Sagittarius rising. Oh, that's right. Okay. Okay, but that's nice. Okay, go on. That helps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it helps to break out of it, but it's that thing of where it um it helps to um to see things from a different light. It helps to understand that it isn't so um it isn't all about me, Taurus is also fourth ray and um as we know taurus you know has that can have that toddler energy and and gets afflicted with that disease i love alan's line he calls it me my myitis you know it's mm -hmm. like no you know the toddler's manifesto is i see something it's mine if 
If I, if you touch it and you put it down, it's mine. If I touch it and you touch it, it's mine, you know, but if it's broken, it's yours. I mean, that's, that's Taurus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, I just want to say, when I say these things, I don't mean any denigration or degradation of any sign whatsoever, or any planet. I don't look at it that way. I think part of it is about making fun of our little idiosyncrasies so we can, I mean, if we can make fun of ourselves, if we can get out of whatever it is that keeps us stuck in our little ways, I mean, hello, I'm a Scorpio moon and Aquarius sun. If I can do it, anyone can do it. <laughs> yes, that, that seems about right. Um, yeah. Okay. So thank you so much. I have so many more questions and I love chatting with you and everyone and people are, you know, saying thank you. And um, this was a great session and we look forward to the workshops and everyone just check out Michael's book. I definitely will. And um, I'm looking forward to learning more with all of you and I hope you have a wonderful Saturday. Remember, if you haven't yet donated, um, please do. Anything helps to to help us keep this scholarship fund going. And um, Michael, you do you you mentioned you do personal readings as well, right? Yeah, if I do personal readings, please feel free to check out my website, which is cornmichael.com, or email me if you have any questions. Um, I'm happy to answer some really simple stuff. If you want something more sophisticated, I'm happy to do a reading. Um, Looking forward to the classes. Hope you guys will enjoy them as much as I enjoy giving them. And um, yeah, thank you so much for spending your time on a Saturday. And thank you so much, Kaylin, for holding such a beautiful space. Blessings. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being present and open and, and sharing your wisdom. Um, we, we very much enjoy you here at Kepler. So thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. And stay safe, everyone. Stay safe, please.